Hello, class. It is I, Kylo Limit the Ren, here to show you a preview of calculus. You know what Chewbacca's favorite website is? Wikipedia. The first vocabulary term is calculus. That is the mathematics of velocities, accelerations, tangent lines, slopes, areas, volumes, arc lengths, centroids, curvatures, and a variety of other concepts that have enabled scientists and engineers and economists to model real life situations. So here you can see a word cloud of the terms used in calculus and some of the big ones that we're going to go over are limits, derivatives, and integrals, usually in that order. And these things are used in everyday life and are super important. So it's lucky that you are taking calculus. The second vocabulary term is tangent line. That is a straight line that intersects a function at only one point. On the other side of that would be a secant line, which is a straight line that intersects a function at two or more points. Here you can see we have our function in blue. Our tangent line is a line that intersects the blue function at only one point. And you can see right at the tip of this curve right here, that tangent line intersects the function. A secant line, however, intersects the function at two or more points. So the secant line would end up going through this function at both of these points, making it a secant line. Now this graph over here actually shows you a bunch of secant lines, the first one going through P and Q, and then eventually turning into a tangent line at point P. And this is actually a way you can estimate the slope of a particular function at a given point. Let's say I wanted to find the slope of this function at point P. What I could do is just choose two points, P and Q, and then keep changing this Q so that it's closer and closer and closer to P, and calculate the slopes between these two points and I could then estimate the slope of this particular function at point P and that's something we use in calculus. I hate my dad! It's example time! Now example one says decide whether the problem can be solved using pre-calculus or whether calculus is required. If the problem can be solved using pre-calculus, solve it. If the problem seems to require calculus, explain your reasoning and use a graphical or numerical approach to estimate the solution. So the first one says find the distance traveled in 15 seconds by an object traveling at a constant velocity of 20 feet per second. Now, you could know this from pre-calculus or you could know this from physics if you've taken that already. Distance is equal to rate times time. I call it the DIRT formula. You may know it by something else. We know distance equals rate times time. It gives us a time. It gives us a rate. So in order to figure out the distance, you just multiply these two values together and you end up getting your distance as 300 feet. Part B says Rihanna is riding her Segway on a path modeled by the function f of x is equal to 0.12 times 5x minus x squared, where x and f of x are measured in miles. And see the figure. Find the rate of change of elevation at x is equal to 2. So what this problem is asking you to find is the slope of this function, rate of change, at x is equal to 2. Well, this is a curve. How do I figure out what the slope of this function is at x is equal to 2. That doesn't make any sense. So I haven't learned that yet, therefore it requires calculus. Now, what we just talked about in the previous slide when we were talking about tangent lines and secant lines is that you can actually estimate the slope of this particular function at x is equal to 2 by creating a secant line where two points are super close together. Your actual answer for this is 0.12, but a way that we can estimate it is, again, by creating a tangent line to x is equal to 2 and picking two points on that tangent line and calculating the slope between those two points. So if I do that, I get 1 sixth or 0.17. Now, again, we just drew a rough tangent line at x is equal to 2, therefore Therefore, we do not have the exact slope. The exact slope we find using calculus, and we'll talk about that later on. Anakin was not the chosen one. I was. You try. Okay, so this says find the distance traveled in six seconds by an object traveling at a velocity of 20 plus 7 cosine t feet per second. 
this might look immediately like a dirt formula, distance equals rate times time. But the problem with that is our velocity is not a constant. It's not 55 miles per hour or 22 feet per second. What it is, is a function, 20 plus seven cosine t. And for those of you seeing the cosine function, it looks something like this. So what we're gonna have to do is use calculus in this instance. And that's because we would never be able to find the distance traveled over those six seconds if our velocity is constantly changing. So the actual answer would be 118.044 feet. A way we could estimate this is we could get the average velocity over those six seconds. Now the way we could do that would be to just plug in one for t, plug in two for t, plug in three for t, four for t, five for t, and six for t. If I were to then add those up and divide by six, that would give me an average velocity over those first six seconds, which would be approximately 19.678. Now what I could do is take that average velocity over the first six seconds, plug that in the distance equals rate times time formula. Our time then would be six seconds. And if I were to multiply these two things together, I would get approximately 118.070 feet, which is remarkably close to the 118.044 feet. That is the actual answer. Now part B says Jay-Z is riding his jet ski on a path modeled by the function f of x is equal to 4.2x, where x and f of x are measured in miles. Find the rate of change of elevation at x equals 2. So here we are going to graph our particular function f of x is equal to 4.2x, which is in the form y equals mx plus b, where m is our slope, 4.2, and our b is going to be our y-intercept, that would be 0. Now, apparently, Jay-Z is riding his jet ski up a mountain, which is something I guess we can ignore. What we're going to do is we're going to figure out what the rate of change of this elevation is at x is equal to 2. In the previous example, we were not able to find the exact rate of change because the function was curved. But here we have a function that is a straight line, which means its rate of change or its slope is the same throughout the entire function. So I can find the slope here using two points, over here using two points. Either way, it's going to be the same. So if I pick two points on this particular function using pre-calculus, I can determine what the slope is, right? Just use the slope formula, which we know and I plug in those two points to the slope formula and I end up getting a slope of 4.2. And we already knew that because we said the function was in slope intercept form and our m, our slope, is 4.2. So the slope of the whole function is 4.2. Therefore, at x is equal to 2, it has a rate of change or slope of 4.2. So that is our rate of change of elevation at x is equal to 2. Now example two says determine whether you can find the area of the region using pre-calculus. If you can, find it. If the problem seems to require calculus, explain your reasoning and use a graphical or numerical approach to estimate the solution. Now here we have a rectangle and you can go back to geometry. You don't even have to go back to pre-calculus and you can determine the area of this rectangle using base times height. The base looks like it's five, the height looks like it's two units. So if we multiply five units by two units, you end up getting 10 units squared or square units. Remember to put those on because we are finding area. Now for part B, we have a function that is curved. So if you want to find the area under a curve, that is something that you actually learn in calculus. But for now, we can estimate the solution using pre-calculus by breaking this up into two particular shapes that you already know the area formulas for. We could break it up into a rectangle and a trapezoid. Now the area formulas for a rectangle, base times height, and a trapezoid, one half the height times the sum of the bases, we can then add together to find the approximate area under the curve. So if I were to plug in the base of the rectangle, which looks like it's 11 units, the height, which looks like it's five units. And then for the trapezoid, remember it has two bases. One base would be 10 units, one base would be five units, and then the height would be four units. Multiply these together, add them up, and you end up getting 85 units squared or square units as an approximate area under this curve. Now remember, we can find the actual area of the curve using calculus later on. Do or do not, there is no try, except for this, you try. Okay, so we're doing the same thing. We're finding the area under the curve here. This is another area of the curve problem, which means it requires calculus, but we can use pre-calculus or geometry formulas to estimate the solution. 
Now, I can break this up into a rectangle and a triangle and then find the sum of those two areas to estimate the area under the curve. Now, our rectangle has a base of five units, a height of four units. Our triangle has a base of five units and a height of five units. And remember, the area of a triangle formula is one half base times height. So if I were to add these two areas together, I would get an approximate area under the curve of 32.5 units squared or square units. Here we just have a triangle, which means I use the area formula, one half base times height, which we learned from geometry or pre-calculus. So I plug in my base, which is four units. I plug in my height, which is eight units, then multiply those together, multiply that by half, and I end up getting 16 units squared or square units as the area under this curve. Now example three says, consider the function f of x is equal to the square root of x minus one and the point p at five comma two on the graph of f. Graph f and the secant lines passing through our point p and r at x comma f of x for x values of 1, 3, and 6. So the first thing we have to do is graph this function. It is a square root function, which for those of you who remember, starts at a point and then continues on in a curved manner. Now, in order to graph this, what I do is I create a t-table and I need a starting point. So our starting point, if you remember, this is of the form y is equal to a times rad x minus h plus k. Our starting point is at h comma k. So in this case, that would be at one comma zero. So that's our starting point. I'm gonna plug that in the top of the t-table and plot that point over here. Again, it's gonna start at this point and continue on in a curved manner. So what I do is I now have to pick x values that I will then plug in to find the y values that go with them. Now I'm not gonna go two, three, four, five, because what would happen is I would end up getting some irrational numbers over here that you wouldn't know exactly where to plot. What I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna pick x values that when I plug into the function, give me perfect squares under the radical. And I could then take the square root of them and get an actual natural number over here. So let's go ahead and do that. I plugged in one first, right? And one minus one gave me zero and the square root of zero is zero. That's why I got that. How do I get one under the radical? What do I plug in for X? I would have to plug in two. So two minus one gives me one under the radical and the square root of one is one. That's why it's the y value that goes with this x value. I can then plot the point two comma one. What's the next perfect square after one? That would be four. So how do I get four under the radical? I would have to plug in for x, five. Now five minus one gives me four under the radical and the square root of four then is two. So that's my next point, five comma two that I can plot on my graph. The next perfect square after four would then be nine. So how do I get nine? I would have to plug in 10 for x. 10 minus one would give me nine under the radical and the square root of nine then is three. So my next point then would be 10 comma 3. Now I've run out of room on my graph but I can do another point just because the next perfect square would be 16 so I'd have to plug in 17 for x. 17 minus 1 gives me 16 and the square root of 16 is 4. So I have my points. I can then draw my graph looking something like this and I have my function and my point p at 5 comma 2. Now part B is tasking us to find the slope of each secant line. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna plug in these particular points to this function, get the y values that go with them. And with those points, we're gonna draw a line going through one of the points and point P, then through the other point and point P, and then through that last point and point P. And we're going to then calculate the slopes of those secant lines. So let's start with one. So if I were to plug in one to the function, we already did that, we get one comma zero. That's our point. Now, for that secant line, we draw a line going through this point and our point P, and we have a secant line. Now, we can find the slope of that using the slope formula, and these two points, we plug into the slope formula, and we end up getting 1 half or 0.5. Now for this next one at x is equal to three, we do not have that on our t-table. So what we do is we take three as our x value, plug it into the function, three minus one gives me two, and the square root of two is just rad two. So we have a point at three comma rad two on our red function. Now let's find the slope of this secant line. So we'll draw that going through our points three comma rad two and our point P. We then find the slope using the slope formula again and plugging in these two points this time, okay? Point P and three comma rad two. We end up getting a slope of approximately 0.298. And our last one is at six, X is equal to six, which again, we don't have on our T table, but we can plug that in here. And to our function, six minus one is gonna give me five and square root of five then 
is going to be the y value that goes with that particular point. We draw our last secant line going through p and this purple point that we just plotted and calculate the slope of that secant line using, again, the slope formula. And we end up getting 0.236. Now this last part says use the results of part b to estimate the slope of the tangent line to the graph of f at p 5 comma 2. Describe how to improve your approximation of the slope. So this is actually something we talked about in the beginning when we were talking about our vocabulary and secant lines and tangent lines. Basically what we said was that if you want to approximate the slope of a line that is tangent to a curve, what you do is pick another point that is really close to that point of tangency and calculate the slope of the secant line between those two points. So here I have a point that's really far out, a point that's closer, and a point that's really close. And you can see that the slopes go from 0.5 to 0.298 and then once you get past our point of tangency, you get to 0.236. So an approximate slope of the tangent line to this curve at point P then would be somewhere between 0.29 and 0.23, somewhere in between there. So because this is really close, this last one, 0.236, I'm going to say that our slope of our tangent line, because it has to be somewhere in between these two slopes, would be about 0.25. And that would be a close approximation approximation because, again, our secant line really far away had a slope of 0.5. As we got closer, it started narrowing down to about 0.25. And then once we picked a point that was past point P, we got a slope that was below 0.25. So good approximation of the slope of our curve at x is equal to 5 would be 0.25. And that's how you approximate the slope of a tangent line.